in your introduction, Helen, you said how it's nice to see lots of familiar faces. For me, actually, it's nice to see hardly any faces I know. What happens when you organize events as BirdLife Cyprus or as any other NGO, you often end up preaching to the converted. Now, that's not me saying you folks are not environmentalists, but you end up talking to the usual suspects. So it's really nice to not know anyone in this audience. That's, that's really useful. While I was wandering around, I, my attention was drawn to this very nice, uh, well, see, I'm, I'm not an artist. I know what you call these things. It's an installation, the, the, uh, the protest thing there. Um, anyway, it's very good. It's very effective. And there's a banner that says, to change everything, we need everyone. What a load of rubbish. I mean, OK, when it comes to environment, and I think Maria will agree with me, we want to change pretty much everything pretty much everything. But thankfully, we don't need everyone. The evidence is, if you look at the, the history of activism, or to put it much more simply, because defining what activism is is not an easy thing, folks, the history of trying to change things, what is required is actually a remarkably small number of dedicated people with a single purpose and you can really change things just as well. BirdLife Cyprus has you know, 500 members, and I, I won't get into how many of those are uh, what I would call activists. You know, we're a very small group. The other environmental NGOs in Cyprus are small groups. But these small groups can achieve, can achieve a lot. And, and we certainly need to achieve a lot. Um, so what, what I'm going to try and cover in the next half hour is, well, who BirdLife Cyprus is, uh, let's see if I do that, great. So that's just a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about by way of introduction, you know, who we are, a little bit about why we actually need birds and nature. I'm not gonna go into great depth on that. It's an area that's of tremendous interest to me in, from a more sort of academic perspective. We can come back to it if you'd like to at the end. Just to give you a picture then of how important Cyprus is for birds. Cyprus is an amazing place for birds. And then I want to talk about what we do as an organization. And um, I know, I know Mar Maria after me will talk a lot about marine issues, so I will try to talk about the marine stuff we've done as, as well to cover that aspect. Okay. So who are we? Um, you already heard in the introduction, we're, we're a non-governmental organization, so we're not for profit, we're completely independent. Only about 1% of our funding comes from government, which would be like more. Yeah, of course we would like more. Funding is always important. But we also want to maintain our independence and our completely independent voice. So it's good that we're not in any way dependent upon the government. Um, there used to be two Cyprus ornithological societies, one COS 57, 170. They merged in 2003. And soon after, we became the partners of BirdLife International in Cyprus. We currently have an office with 13 full-time staff, which for an NGO in Cyprus is, is huge. It may not sound big, but for a non-governmental organization in Cyprus, it's quite big. And as I said, we have about 500 members and about, I don't know, maybe 10 times that number of supporters, so people who are not members, but they support our, our actions and our efforts. BirdLife International is an organization with partners, and I think the latest count is 114 different countries the world over. BirdLife is, is rather different to a lot of um, worldwide nature conservation organizations, ones that you perhaps know rather better, like the World Wildlife Fund or Friends of the Earth, in the sense that we're very much a grassroots organization. Uh, the others are quite top-down. Yeah, decisions are taken centrally and they're implemented. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But, you know, we're very much the other way around. We're quite a democratic organization. So even a small partner like BirdLife Cyprus gets to play a part in things that happen centrally, which, which for us is really important. I've just come back, actually, from the, from the one, two, three, I think it's the sixth world conference of BirdLife International where all the partners get together uh, every four years, like the World Cup, but, but much, more, much more relevant. 
uh, perhaps not as exciting, but uh, much more to the point. Um, and this was, this was different to all the other world conferences I've been to. I've been lucky to go to the last, last four. It was different because it was held in Cambridge, and that was very boring, because the other ones were in South Africa, in Canada, and Argentina, and that was amazing. So it, it was pretty dull. But it was also different because BirdLife International was celebrating 100 years, a century of existence, of, of activism for change to, to save nature. And the thing that came out extremely strongly from the whole conference was a real, almost tangible sense of urgency. If we look at the numbers, if we look at the data, in terms of ecosystem collapse, and the two sort of headline figures are what's happening with climate change and what's happening with species loss which is what I'll focus on, because that's, that's more our area. Those two things are at such a critical point now that if we don't do something effective over the next 10 years, really, we can all just go pack up and go home. But it won't be much of a home to go to. We have 10 years in which to change things. We're getting to those points where you're getting into positive feedback loops. You're getting into real collapse. We have 10 years. We have a decade. After that, you know, we can shout about it as much as we like. It will be too late. It will be too late. So that's quite a weight um, to carry because I think um, organizations like BirdLife Cyprus have a, a serious role to play in all that. Going back to my original suggestion that it's small groups of active people working together that can actually, that can actually make a difference. So just, just to give you an idea there of, of what our vision is as an organization and what our mission is. We start from birds, obviously. That's what we know about. That's what we love most. But it doesn't matter where you start from in nature. You immediately, very fast, get to the whole picture. right? So we take birds as an indicator of where we are and what's happening, what we know. But it wouldn't matter whether we started from, I don't know, slugs or, or plants or orchids or butterflies. You soon get to the same problems and the same things you need to do in terms of changing things. But our starting point happens to be birds. Um, I realize now that I've, I've failed. You can't read the, the photo credit. I've failed to credit the photographers throughout, almost. I, I can't remember who took all these photographs. We're lucky that we have a lot of photographers, uh, most of them locally based, who are very generous with giving us their photos. I will just say none of them are mine. Okay, I can't take a photograph to save my life. So these are all contributed by excellent supporters and members. Um, this one is by Albert Stoker, who's a, who's a German who has adopted Cyprus as his home. I like that photo. These are little owls, Kukufgao, uh, Skukubaya in Cypriot. And they're young little owls, as you can probably see by their preyful nature. But I think it links to the idea I'm trying to put across of the importance of the balance of, of nature, if you like. That's about as artistic as my presentation gets, by the way. That was my foray into art, folks. That, that's it, you know? So what's, what's it all about? And I think even as conservationists, we, we often make the mistake of assuming that people really understand and get, and more to the point, are able to persuade others of the reason why nature is important. But if you stop and think about it, and you put yourself in the position that I have often been in of trying to persuade a politician or another disinterested party of why nature is important, it isn't that simple. In the conservation movement, I mean, we can all, we can all say, OK, we learned it in primary school. We need forests. We need seagrass beds. We need natural systems. And we have a basic understanding of why we need those systems, which is, if you break it down into a slightly more quasi-scientific talk, is to do with ecosystem services, isn't it? It's to do with what these systems provide for us. So the forests that we're lucky enough to have in our mountains act as a sponge, if you like, holding rainfall and releasing it slowly. Without that, 
you know, we'd just have flood and, and drought. We'd have the two extremes, but it wouldn't be sustainable in any way. So at a system level, it's not too difficult to understand it, especially if you remember that farmland systems that we all completely depend upon for our food are ecosystems. They're not they're semi-natural ecosystems, they're altered ecosystems, but they're ecosystems. But then when you go that one step further and you have to explain that a natural forest is completely different to a forestry department plantation as they envisaged it 20 years ago, if I'm being kind to them, and for the 400 years before that, which is a monoculture of trees in a row, right? And that, I'm sure you can get that those are completely different things, but the crucial, tangible, concrete reasons why they're very different are what biodiversity conservation, nature conservation are about, right? And the evidence is, and I'm, and I'm talking here, I'm not talking in terms of ethics, obviously, I think there's a very strong ethical argument for conserving nature, conserving wild creatures, which simply put is that this owl has as much right to be on the planet as I do, or as, or as you do, and most of, the, most of the threats to nature are entirely man-made, they're anthropogenic, right? So, putting, but putting that aside, and putting aside even the emotional argument, you know, I happen to love owls and I, I love walking in the forest, so th those, those are important, but I'm talking about concrete utilitarian scientific reasons. The evidence is, from a lot of studies, that you need a complexity, a diversity of nature, a system, in order for it to be productive in the long term. And by the way, none of this works unless you look at it in the long term. In the short term, it can be very effective just to grow one crop, right? Monoculture it can be very productive, it's just not sustainable. So to be productive in the long term and to be stable to be resilient to change. And that's particularly relevant when we're talking about a climate change world, where nature, whether that is a forest or a wetland or a seagrass bed or fakrotiri or farmland, is in a situation where it has to adapt and it has to adapt at an extraordinarily fast rate. If we don't have something close to the full complement of species in a system that have, are the result of millennia of evolution, then it's not going to survive very well. And at the end of the day, it's going to come back to us. I said much more about that than I was planning to, but uh, that's because it's just an area of particular interest to me. Um, so some of the latest figures <coughs> on birds, to give you a picture of how bad the situation is, is that one in eight species across the globe are about to disappear. One in eight species are about to disappear. And almost half of all species on the planet have declining populations. Species disappearance is a big headline thing. You know, if a rhinoceros goes, we're never going to have rhinoceros again, and that's terrible, obviously. But we mustn't forget that what's happening on a local scale. So we don't have many species in Cyprus that are about to disappear on a global scale. But what matters in an ecosystem sense is that populations are disappearing. So the systems are becoming grossly simplified and therefore very, very much weaker than we need them to be to survive. The, these numbers, by the way, especially the one in eight, are much worse for other groups of species like mammals or, or plants. Um, so that may seem bad, but actually the overall picture is, is much worse than that. Okay. Um, Enough of the doom and gloom for now, though unfortunately that, that's all real. As I said at the beginning, Cyprus is an amazing place for, bird, for birds. We have recorded over 400 different species on our island. Um, only about 300 of those are regular species, some of the rarest. So that's an amazing diversity of species. From, from the robins in the top corner there, which are just arriving now for the winter, to amazing uh, raptors like the peregrine falcon, the fastest bird in the world, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to, um, I'm not gonna go through 400 species, I think that might test your patience a little bit. Um, Cyprus is especially amazing because we sit on a key migration path. We are a stepping stone 
for hundreds of thousands of birds going down to Africa now, September and October, going back up to Europe to breed in March and April. These are, these are white storks over, if I'm not mistaken, over Akarotiri two years ago. So Cyprus has a crucial role as a place for birds to rest and refuel a bit because sea crossings are always difficult for land creatures like, like birds. And then we have, it used to be two, but we now have three species, and this is one of them, the, the Cyprus warbler, or Tripomazis, which are completely unique to Cyprus. They're found only in Cyprus. Because we're an island, we're a bit isolated from all the area around by the, by the sea crossing. And these species have been isolated long enough that they've become unique. They're completely, they're completely Cypriot. This one has a, has a very monotonous, chuntering call that sounds very much like a coffee shop conversation. You know, it, it really is wonderfully, beautifully Cypriot. Uh, it's not doing very well, though. It's not doing very well because of habitat changes. So if we don't do something about it, this is probably the first species in Cyprus that could become a threatened species on a global scale. Because if we lose it here, we've lost it everywhere, right? Cyprus wheat here is Califurta, which is also on our emblem. Though we've made it a bit more artistic now, so it's not so obvious. It used to be more obvious that that was our emblem. But now the artistic part of the office has taken over, which is all fine and good, of course. Um, that's another one that comes in the summer. Some of our, uh, two of our uh, endemic species actually migrate. So they don't spend the whole year here, but they only breed here, so they're endemic. And the one that has very recently achieved endemic status is, is this one, which you hear calling all over Cyprus in the spring and summer evenings, the, the Fubi, the, the Cyprus Scopsal. It's one of the main differentiations with the European population is it has a double call note. It, it talks to itself. It talks to itself. Wonderful little owl, minute. So those are our really precious species, but only part of the, the rich variety that we have on the island. Mm. OK, I'm moving now into trying to cover very fast um, what we do as an organization. So, First point, port of call, is you have to know what's happening with your species of interest. If you're going to be realistic, uh, correct, and believable in your argumentation to get things changed. So monitoring, which is led by my colleague Christina, Christina Ironimidu, is a key part of it. We have programs for monitoring common birds, for monitoring wetland birds, for monitoring rare species like the Ordwin's gulls and the raptors that come through on migration, especially through Akrodiri just down the road. Um, yeah, so that allows us to have a picture of what's going on. And we feed in this data to the worldwide picture, of course, through BirdLife International to, to help have an idea of what's going on. And we've just won, this is some good news from two days ago, we've just won the, the tender from the government to do the analysis and the data collection for Cyprus's official report to Europe. So, you know, at least we are reasonably confident that that report will be a solid and reliable report. Right, so th this, is, this is crossing over now into the area of what is key in terms of threats to birds and to wildlife and, and to nature. And, and what we do. So if birds don't have somewhere to live, which in ecology is, is a habitat, then they're not going to survive. It's, it's very simple, and it is as simple as that. So one of the first jobs we did, and it was a bicommunal project, so we did it with the Turkish Cypriot Bird Protection Society, Kushgor, as well, was to identify these 34 areas following criteria that are recognized by Brussels. They're recognized by the European Court of Justice as being sound and scientific. Um, so these are the most important areas for birds, for breeding, for migration. You can see Akrotiri is in there, but it's a widespread across the island. Includes habitats like forests, um, wetlands, but also agricultural areas. Agricultural areas can be fantastic for wildlife if they're not too intensively farmed. If you don't over farm, then farming and wildlife can survive very well together. 
Uh, in, in the government control areas, we've done very well on this, at least on paper, in the sense that all these important bird areas, IBAs as we call them, are now, they now have legal status as protected areas, as Natura 2000 sites, as part of the Europe-wide network of protected areas. Whether they're effectively protected in practice on the ground is a whole other issue, and it's an issue that we spend a lot of our a lot of our time and, and energy on. Um, two of the more high-profile cases we've been, we've been battling, we've been fighting along with other environmental NGOs are Agamas on the right, as I'm looking at it, and, and Agrodiri, two areas where we've had recently the, the state, and in the case of Agamas, we're talking about Cyprus, in the case of Agrodiri, we're talking about Britain, basically, because it's, it's within the British basis, sadly. Um, they've proposed some pretty mad plans for zoning, which would result in crazy levels of development. In the case of Agrodiri, at the moment, I can be reasonably confident that we've managed to block the worst ideas, which included things like extending the road at the bottom of Ladies Mile, if you're familiar with that area, to go to the village right across the Salt Lake. Um, whereas in the case of Agamas, it's very much up, very much up in the air. We've been fighting a very good plan. We thought we got to a point where we'd defeated the worst ideas in that, but elections are coming up and there's a lot of political maneuvering to try and bring at least some of those very bad uh, proposals back to the table. So that's an ongoing fight. And again, this is, if you can save habitats, then you've done half your job. So what we try and do in a nutshell as BirdLife Cyprus is obviously we try to do an awareness raising in general. I'll come back to that at the end. But we try to influence policy because that's, you know, we could do as much as we wanted as a small group of environmentalists. But if you can change government policy or influence it, then that will have a much bigger impact on a much bigger scale, obviously. The other thing we try to do, so that, so that involves essentially confrontation with government. Yeah? It involves being in the government space, trying to participate, but also giving them a hard time, basically, because they're not doing a good enough job. This is one, and I'll show you a few examples, of the other approach we adopt, which is to try and get funding for projects to work with the government and other NGOs and local communities to achieve change on the ground in specific areas. And Oroklini Lake is a very good example because it was the first one we tried through life project funding. When we began, this, this wonderful wetland, which is just to the east of Larnaca town, was destined to be filled in and turned into developments and futsal pitches and other wonderful things like that. Today this, which is the smallest Natura 2000 site on the island, but it's an absolute jewel, has turned the corner completely. It's, it's fenced off, it's protected, it's managed, there are bird hides so you can go and see the birds without disturbing them. And most important of all, through this project, the local community is now on side. They actively want to protect this area. That is a, an 180 degrees turnaround. It's wonderful. It, it's basically the only example we have at the moment in Cyprus of really good management of a Natura 2000 site in practice. Not just on paper, but in practice. So we're, we always shout about that one. If you haven't been there, go. It's an amazing site. Another site that has been transformed in recent years is Akrotiri Marsh, or Livadi, as it's sometimes called, or Fasuri Marsh. Um, this was taken over by reeds completely because the cows had gone, the cypress cows, the cypress breed of cows had gone. With a project with funding from, from the UK, Darwin Plus, uh, we managed to bring back the cows again, working with the local community. And the cows go in, they eat the reeds, and they diversify the habitat. So you get back to a lovely mosaic of habitat, which is crucial. Biodiversity isn't just about species, it's about habitats as well. You want, you want diversity. And species like the globally threatened ferruginous duck, Valtobapia, have, have returned there and are breeding there, which is great. And we now have another program which is trying to go a bit wider, 
and also build ecotourism. So put this area of Cyprus on the map of Europe as a tourism destination for people who want to see and enjoy nature. Because we believe that's part of the answer to getting the public and politicians on side in terms of protecting key sites. The second program, if I'm honest, is proving an incredible challenge, but I, I don't want to go into details on that unless you, unless you bring it up with questions. This is a, a nice little project that, where we're copying, we're copying what's been done further to the east in Israel with amazing success. Barn owls, atrabobulia in Greek, are amazing consumers of rats. When they have young, they'll eat more than a thousand rats in a year. You know, they specialize on rats. We have a huge rat problem in Cyprus, or rather, I don't actually think we have a huge rat problem in Cyprus, but if you talk to a hunter or a farmer, they'll tell you we have a huge rat problem in Cyprus. And Cyprus is full of rat poison. There is a government factory that produces rat poison and gives it out basically for nothing. So there is rat poison everywhere. Once you release a poison like that into the ecosystem, you just don't know what it's going to affect. It has, you know, the ecotoxicology of it gets complicated, but it's actually quite simple. It's just bad news. Other things get poisoned, including the owls. So what we're trying to do is put up these boxes because a limiting factor of this owl is finding nesting sites. Right? And if you put out a box, there's enough of a population already that they'll come and adopt that area. So the boxes are being put up in farmland areas that have rat problems as an alternative to using poison. Um, we're working with the forestry department, the agriculture department, game and fauna. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. So all the relevant departments. And we're hoping that this will begin to make a difference. Um, and it's something we get quite enthusiastic about, as you can see. That's my colleague Mel there, who runs our project. If, so that, that is a barn owl on that side, on the left. That's an adult. This is actually a scops owl. The, the boxes get used by other species as well. It's all good. It's all good. Speaking of um, very threatened species, and I think this was the last project I wanted to talk about because I'm, I'm aware of time running on, the, the griffin vulture is absolutely on the brink of extinction in Cyprus. We have eight Cypriot vultures left. Eight. Um, we now have a project. We're working with Terra Cypria that's based in Limassol, another environmental NGO. Uh, the Game and Fauna Service, so the responsible government department for, for birds, also for hunting. And the Vulture Conservation Foundation, who are an international organization, the expert in vultures. Vultures are one of the most threatened groups of birds worldwide. Over 90% decline in parts of the world like India, and that's happening in Africa as well. They used to be very common in Cyprus. Vultures used to be very common. Vultures, as you, I'm sure you know, are the cleanup crew of the countryside. They eat dead things, and they eat dead things much faster than wild dogs or foxes or rats or even insects consume dead things. So they're wonderful at limiting disease and cleaning up the countryside. Now, if you think back, those of you who are old enough to think that far back, um, we used to have a lot of donkeys in Cyprus. We used to have a lot of goats and sheep. We still have a lot of goats and sheep, but they're penned nowadays. So we used to have a lot of free roaming. So there was a lot of food for vultures to eat. That has changed. That has changed dramatically. And that's a difficult factor to affect. But the real problem at the moment is poison. The most immediate problem is poison. Um, it's a different type of poison to the one that uh, we were talking about in the context of the barn owl and rats. This is lethal uh, banned pesticides like Linate that are put out not for the vulture, but for foxes or stray dogs. But the vulture is very, very efficient at finding a carcass that has been laced with poison. So we had until four, five months ago, 20 vultures, one poisoning incident, and we're down to eight. And it's absolutely critical. Luckily, the Spanish government is helping us. They are donating birds to Cyprus. We're flying in birds and releasing them to 
join up with the, the local population and give it a boost. It, it's got to that point with the vulture that if we don't support them, they will never of their own accord be able to recover their numbers. We lose a whole ecosystem service if we lose the vultures. We also lose an amazing potential tourism product if we lose vultures. People will come from Europe to see vultures in Cyprus. Um, I, I mean, poisoning, even though it's completely illegal, is very widespread. And no one has ever been uh, convicted of poisoning. No one has ever been convicted of poisoning. This is one of the things we want to change through this, this project. Uh, we're doing a lot of awareness raising to change that, but we're also trying to push some cases in, in court. Right, now, last but not least, let, let's talk about the ocean, let's talk about the seas around Cyprus. And this was another bicommunal, so all island project that is just about coming to the end now after four years uh, with funding from the Mava Foundation. And it was to look at one particular issue to do with fisheries, which is bycatch. Uh, fishing is, is one of the tragedies of human misuse of natural resources. We've known for at least 50 years how fishing on a commercial scale needs to be carried out in order to be sustainable. The answers have been there, the data has been there, and yet, and yet even today, the European Union actively funds unsustainable fishing, trawler fleets, which are a complete you know, anathema in terms of trying to achieve sustainability. That, that's simplifying a very big issue. But one of the aspects with this is that birds and other creatures are drawn to the fishing activity and to the fish that are caught in nets, and they get caught as well. Worldwide, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. All these photos were taken by um, Silvio Rusmigo as part of this project in order to try and publicize the work we did with fishermen with local fishermen to try and trial solutions to the bycatch issue. Uh, this project was with SPOT, which is the Turtle Protection Society in the north, in occupied Cyprus, and with Analia Fisis, and, and it involved a lot of many hours of sea watching. The seabirds are perhaps the least well known of our birds in Cyprus for obvious reasons. They're out there at sea, so it's, it's not easy to see what's going on. So we got a lot of data from that, which was very useful. And as I said before, we worked with, with the fishers themselves to try and find solutions. There are things you can do with the nets to make them much more detectable to non-target species like turtles or, or sharks or birds to reduce the bycatch, and we've been trialing that. From a, you know, if I was strictly selfish and just focused on birds because with bird life I'd say there's not a big problem because there doesn't seem to be a big problem so much with birds and bycatch in Cyprus. That's partly because we just don't have many seabirds because this part of the Mediterranean is very poor in nutrients so it's not very, it's not very productive. It's wonderfully diverse in terms of what's out there but it's not very productive so there's not a lot for the seabirds to feed on so it's not like the seas found Scandinavia or Britain, which are absolutely brimming with the seabirds. But there are serious issues with bycatch of sea turtles, sharks, and rays, which are a very threatened group. Uh, so we'll continue, we're trying to find funding to continue working with fishermen. The main problem are not, of course, these small-scale fishers. I hope that's obvious. You know, there is problem issues with this, but the main problem is the big trawler fleets that are further out to sea around Cyprus. Yeah, so we gathered a lot of data and we're trying to do this. If you think back to the map I showed you at first with the important bed areas, we're trying to do the same for the sea because you know, Cyprus should be designating protected areas for wildlife at sea as well. Okay, well, I, I can't um, talk to you about what we do without tackling this issue that I'm sure you've all heard about before, Ambelobulia, the whole issue with illegal bird trapping. It's it's one of the ugly traditions of Cyprus, but it's also no longer, it can't with any honesty be described as a tradition anymore. It's changed so much in the last 40, 50 years. 
that it's become an industrial scale practice using technology like bird calling devices. You know, you blast the song of the bird out across the countryside at night. Migrating birds, which move mostly at night, at least small songbirds like the, the black cap caught on that lime stick, they hear this and they assume, well, that must be a fantastic bit of habitat for me to go and rest overnight and recuperate before I continue. So they flood in. And then you have nets, uh, as well as the, the more traditional system of, of lime sticks. And this results in hundreds of thousands of birds being caught. Um, and perhaps the most important thing is that second bullet point there, which is to emphasize that it is completely, completely non-selective. So the trappers may be after Ambelabulia, black caps, and other related species. But we've recorded 155 different species being caught. Everything from, from owls to shrikes, including some very rare species. And we know it's probably more than that. That's just the number we've recorded. So it's completely unsustainable. Completely unsustainable and has to stop. The reason it doesn't stop is that there's a lot, a lot of money in this. You know, a plate of Ambelobulia, it's all illegal, everything. Technically, even eating it is illegal. I'm not saying anyone's ever going to get done for eating anything in Cyprus, but, or anywhere else for that matter. But technically, every aspect of it is illegal. But there's so much money, so a plate of these birds goes from 60 to, to 80 euros. That's 12 birds. Uh, someone who's got a really good trapping site can catch thousands of birds in a year. The, the mafia are involved in this. You know, it's part of their portfolio along with gambling, drugs, prostitution. They do some bird trapping. Some very dangerous people are involved in this. Um, I don't know if Klitos is here, but you know, ask him about his experiences as, as an on-the-ground activist trying to fight this. You know, we're talking about some really dangerous people, a lot of money. But, but look at this. We've been monitoring this systematically since 2002, and I'm in a position to stand here and tell you that this has been reduced by 90% since there. So things can be done, folks. You know, if I'd been talking to you 10 years ago, I would have been far, far more gloomy and negative about this. We, you know, we have reduced it to 10% of what it was. That 10% is still too many birds being killed. It's still unsustainable, but it's still an example of, of success. And it's something that Cyprus is gaining a, a positive reputation for in Europe because of that. I haven't talked about climate. Um, and it may seem ridiculous that I'm, in a sense, that I'm talking about birds being caught in nets uh, when we have the climate crisis looming. And it's no longer the case, I think, that you need to see, just as well, because you can't read that, I'm sure, but you need to see data like that to know that we're in a climate crisis. You basically just have to open your window to know that we're in a climate crisis. We're all living it now. We can all, we can all see how much our climate is changing and the speed with which it's changing. So why are we still working as BirdLife Cyprus on what may seem like peripheral issues when we have this whole thing? Well, the answer is that the answer to the climate crisis lies in nature protection. The most effective way to begin to mop up all that carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere that's causing the climate crisis is to allow nature to recover. And for nature to recover sustainably, it has to be diverse. It has to have biodiversity. It has to have those working cogs of nature that make it strong, that make it strong. So yeah, actually trying to protect birds from bird trapping is relevant to the climate crisis. Trying to protect habitats is relevant to the climate crisis. The other point is that even though, you know, at the moment it, it does often seem rather, rather desperate, the climate issue, this is reversible. This can be changed. And there are already signs that it is being changed. We, we have the technology to do it now. We do know how to do renewables. We are able to help nature recover if we decide to actually implement some of the targets that are being 
decided at the global level for restoring nature, bringing back huge areas to nature to mop up that CO2 sustainably, it can be reversed. Whereas the extinction of a species cannot. This is, fine. This is not final, whereas the biodiversity crisis involves elements that are final. For a species to evolve takes a time scale that is meaningless for us to discuss. Whereas the, the speed with which we are losing species is approximately 100 to 1,000 times the natural background rate. It's 10 to 100 times the rate of species loss in the five previous recorded mass extinction events on our planet. And it's accelerating, folks. So the biodiversity crisis is a crucial part of the answer to climate change. It's also win-win. You know, let's save nature, because there's so many other benefits, and that will help us solve the climate crisis, right? And it's much more final than the issues with climate. Right, OK, so th that's all quite, quite heavy stuff. The, the bit of work that we enjoy doing, much more than the projects, which can be very challenging, though you can have great results, which is great. And you can go to Arogni today and think, wow, you know, what it could have been and how fantastic it is today. Um, but certainly much better than participating in government committees or having meetings of ministers is this, trying to actually influence people, trying to actually change people's attitudes to, uh, to birds, to wildlife. And I have a little bit of a confession to make. When, when we started deciding we wanted to focus on this 15 years ago, my idea was, perhaps being from a slightly more sort of academic background, that we have to explain it all to people. You know, much as I bored you in the introduction with an explanation about natural balance and the importance of species. You don't. You don't. The good news is that all you need to do, especially with children, and they'll bring their parents along with them, is show them a flamingo in a telescope. We were at Rockley this morning. There was, they were doing a festival there on the lake, as I said before. They, they really love their site now. Kids coming on, we set up a telescope. Do you want to see a flamingo? When they work out how to see the telescope and they see it, wow. It's a wow moment for them. And I, I honestly believe, and there is evidence, that, that they will never go back from that. Once they've had their eyes opened to nature, there is within all of us, especially at that young age, an innate love for nature. We just need that door to be opened a little bit. We've seen in the, in the COVID, in the pandemic days, a lot of people linking back to nature. And the beauty of this, which is why we enjoy it, is that it's simple. It just involves sharing a love for nature and getting people to tune in to that. So we do, we do a lot of this work. We've done publications like this simple bird guide, people lean after, we've now translated it into Greek as well. Uh, this has been abgaster, it's amazing. You know, people have been asking for it. And again, it's just opening that door a little bit, getting people engaged. We, since 2019, we've actually had a full-time education officer going to schools. Uh, that, that's not her in the photograph, that's someone else, but that's a bit of a slip up, but never mind, you get the point. You know, in schools, even from a very young age, getting people to engage. We've done it with games as well, to get these messages across in an easy way. We, we strongly believe in this. You know, we need to change people's attitudes to things. It's a long-term investment. We also need to work on the other things because we've only got a decade left. We've only got a decade left in which to change things. Otherwise, it'll be too late. I think that was it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>